thank you for that very kind and most generous, can you hear me, am I being heard, um, introduction. There's no pleasure like being um, welcomed by one of your own former students and now a professor who has far surpassed anything that I've ever done in my life. It's a real pleasure to be here. I just took a picture of uh, Alexander's name on the door and posted it on Facebook and I said, I didn't know what to say, I said, this makes me so happy. <laughs> it does. This is such a sense of fulfillment and joy for me. And um, thank you for inviting me here. Um, I've been a follower and admirer of Professor Afshin Marash's work. I cite his book, Left, Right and Center, first book, second one I can't wait to read. And, um, and I rediscovered today um, the joys of reading world literature today that um, I was so pleased to um, get a chance to speak to, make friends with Kathleen Kelly and also Daniel Simon who showed me a new copy of world literature today and I can't wait to go back. And I used to work with world literature today years and years ago. So what a wonderful rediscovery for me, thank you. Now I've asked Alexander uh, to make sure that I don't bore you for too long. So I'm gonna have my watch out here, but also that I've told him to give me a signal and he said he will snore when he feels it. <laughs> and that will work. <laughs> um, so, um, so I'm talking about the revolution in Iranian women's writing. And I hope I don't let you down with that title, but, uh, but I think that there are in many ways, uh, I'm playing on the word revolution, but I also mean that there has been a kind of revolution. So the flourishing of Iranian women's writing in the wake of the 1979 revolution is a widely recognized phenomenon. And 40 years after a revolution that resulted in curtailing women's rights and their public presence, women have established themselves on the literary scene. In her book, Words Not Swords, Iranian Women Writers and the Freedom of Movement, Farzane Milani, who I believe was here, um, describes this paradoxical phenomenon in correlation to the strictures imposed on women. And I quote Professor Milani, because women have been more confined in their lives and more constrained in their movements, they have had to rely more on words to heal, um, to change the balance of power, to achieve their goals, to negotiate, to seek relief and release, to find an outlet for their creativity." End of quote. But these very expressions of creativity have had to grapple with the image of the ideal woman, which, to quote Farzana Milani again, is, it's, is self-effacing, rather than self-promoting, enclosed rather than exposed, mute rather than vocal, end of quote. Of course, these expectations have long been ingrained in Iranian cultural practices, which used to relegate women primarily to the domestic sphere. Even women's education, when it was um, first introduced and debated in the early 20th century, um, was justified as a means of ensuring that women would make better mothers who would then in turn raise more educated and informed children and by extension future citizens of the country. The idealization of the um, devoted and self-sacrificing mother reflected in Persian literature of the modern era is an extension of what was um, what was deemed a vital service to the nation and the condition for women's participation in the construction of, of uh, our national identity. Now the Islamic Republic's adoption of codes of dress and conduct has been justified as a means of protecting women from inappropriate male attention and safeguarding women's integrity, chastity, and modesty. The rules governing sartorial and behavioral norms extend to the realm of literary and artistic production and are endorsed through government censorship to say nothing of self-censorship. Now, 
I should add that censorship is not new in Iran. It predates the revolution. It's just the rules of censorship have changed and have been adapted to different norms. It's important to recognize that some of the expectations, particularly the ideals of women's modest dress and comportment, predate the revolution. But if before the revolution they were tacit, um, they were intensified and in some cases made into law with the advent of the Islamic Republic. This is a significant, significant departure from the past in that it renders implicit cultural taboos um, that uh, are, have made them into punishable offenses under the law, doubling down on the need for surveillance and discipline. And Iranian society has had a long, passionate relationship with surveillance. It is against this regime of male authority that I situate my analysis of women's prose fiction. Today I'd like to focus on representation of women in fiction written by women before and after the revolution, of course, in very small samples. More specifically, I would like to analyze women's placement. There are two seats here, please. Yeah. Um, I will analyze women's placement and movement in and across um, the private and domestic space uh, to the public space and sphere. So let me begin with Simin Doneshwar's 1969 novel, an incredibly popular novel uh, called Stavushun, which was one of the most popular novels before the revolution. The protagonist, Zari, is depicted as an educated and headstrong woman who is devoted to her husband and children. The novel is set during the Second World War um, and more specifically when the southern region of the country was under British domination um, uh, during the war. And um, I lost my place. By and the novel details the British domination of the local population and economy uh, with the help of complicit Iranians who stand to benefit from their collusion with the British occupiers. Zari, the protagonist, and her husband, Yusuf, um, who belong to the landowning family, are far, more in, uh, far from interested in serving the interests of the British. While they do not themselves suffer from the food sh shortages that resulted because of the occupation, um, they are keenly aware of the hardships that their uh, neighbors, less well-to-do uh, fellow citizens, also have to endure. This is amply signaled in the opening scene of the novel, which describes uh, the lavish wedding of the governor's daughter in Shiraz. Here is Zari, the protagonist, taking in the extravagant display, the Sofre Art, um, for those of you who uh, will know it in Persian. I quote, what a mound of dough, how much flour they must have used. And besides, as Yusuf said, at a time like this, at a time when a single loaf could make a whole family's evening meal, end of quote. As Zari observes this scene, she finds reminders of the coercion and the collusion that has made the wedding extravaganza possible. I quote from the novel. Well, I should say a translation of the novel. The mere sight of the large platters of cookies and pastries and bowls overflowing with mixed nuts made her stomach turn. Turn, rather. <laughs> it dawned on her that um, the first platter had probably been sent by the pastry guild and the second by the nut sellers guild. The five-tiered wedding cake flown in by airplane was a gift from the head command of the foreign troops. The cake was placed on a table on the veranda. The bride and groom were standing hand in hand on its top layer. Behind them was a British flag. Everything was made of pastry." End of quote. Now the symbolic display of foreign occupiers' power is underscored by the presence of British military officers and civilians 
whose cover as spies is easily spotted by discerning eyes. Zari, who attended a British school in Shiraz, uh, tasted their tyranny and defied the headmistress's orders, um, and is, or who defied their orders, is also deeply suspicious of the British. Having, having been subjected to the governor's abuse of power with the implicit approval of the British, she's equally anxious to keep their power away from her home and family. Yet the political turmoil of the time inevitably seeps into the family's um, home and domestic life. Willing to part with personal riches to contain the governor's dominion over her family, nonetheless, she rises to the occasion when she discovers that the governor, governor had ordered that her son's horse be given to his daughter. So they're just openly stealing from people. Zai demonstrates her characteristic boldness to protect her family's interests without relying on her husband, who is actively involved in acts of uh, resistance against the occupiers. There appears to be here in the novel a clear division of labor between Zari and Yusuf. Zari, with Zari in charge of the domestic responsibilities and Yusuf attending to the broader social and national sphere. The division of labor and responsibilities is particularly well illustrated in a chapter of the novel when Yusuf has gathered with a group of similarly minded men to chart out um, an act of armed resistance. Let me just turn to the passage in which Zari enters a room um, where her husband and friends are meeting in secret behind closed doors. Pardon me. I quote, she entered the room and put the hookah in front of her husband. With the doors closed, the air in the parlor was warm and um, sweat was beating on everyone's foreheads and noses. Majid had taken off his jacket and opened his shirt collar. Zari went to the cupboard, brought out straw fans and put them on the table. Then she took small plates, knives and forks um, out of the cupboard and set the table so quietly that she made no, no noise at all. Sohrab was saying, these are people in the meeting, characters, th this action is not just dangerous for me, I know that I am no more than a step away from death. If I don't do this, the nightmare of the incident will drive me crazy. You say this action is a, a kind of show, man, I'm welcoming death with open arms. It was strange. Zari had just cut open two watermelons and both turned out yellow and unripe before they could do genetic modification. That was an indication of <laughs> watermelons being unripe. She took this as a bad omen. The third watermelon was not bad. She was about to cut the edges in zigzags, but she thought, who's going to look at the zigzag shapes of the melon now? She put the large platter, platter of watermelon next to the map of Iran that they spread on the table, the men that is. They were all bending over and looking at it, end of quote. As Zari attempts to provide sustenance to the men engaged in their plans of resistance, armed resistance, she's reminded of her intrusiveness. Turning to Zari, I'm quoting from the novel, he said, that is Yusuf, her husband, says, Khanum, don't make so much noise. All right, she replied, realizing that she was being asked to leave, end of quote. This part of the novel ends with Zari being asked by her husband, as we've just heard, albeit indirectly, to leave them. Even when outside forces intrude into her sphere and she's called upon to extend hospitality to the guests, she remains a hostess and a caretaker, hovering at the edges of the discussion about the nation's future. As the men pour over the map of Iran, Zari considers cutting the watermelon into decorative pieces. The juxtaposition of the metaphoric carving out of the nation by foreign and native forces, and Zari's limited reach to carving up of food and nourishment for the men defending the nation 
delineates women's role in the project of the formation of the nation at this particular juncture. So when her husband, Yusuf, spoiler alert, is, <laughs> is killed, Zahri musters, the, musters up the courage to face the hostile forces beyond her home, facing authorities preventing a public display of mourning and burial. Um, Zahri says defiantly, I quote, they killed my husband unjustly. The least that they could, could have done is to mourn him. Mourning is not forbidden, you know. During his life, we were always afraid and tried to make him afraid. Now that he is dead, what are we afraid of anymore? I, for one, have gone beyond all that. End of quote. There's another seat here. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Please. There is defiance in this scene um, is indeed heroic. And there's another one here. <laughs> This is called multitasking. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I just hate for you to stand. <laughs> Zari's defiance in this scene is indeed heroic and a source of inspiration to those cowed by the police force. But it is only when Yusuf is no longer there to set an example that she fills the vacuum. She's no less heroic at the end of the novel. In fact, what was and continues to be resonant in the novel um, is the synergy between the couple, between Yusuf and Zari, in their political views and their devotion to their family, home, and homeland. The gender division of labor distills the ideal modern family um, in, in which the wife is educated, free-spirited, and yet devoted to her husband and children and her contribution to the nation, nation whose autonomy is at risk and needs the family unit's collective sacrifice. I'd like to, I gave you that example as a one particular uh, way of situating pre-revolution novels. I'd like to now turn to a couple of examples of writing by women after the revolution to look at their representation of domesticity and how women are depicted within their traditional sphere of influence. For the first example, I draw on the Iranian-Armenian writer Zoya Pirzad, who publishes in Persian, um, and her collection of interconnected short stories entitled Apartment from the larger collection called The Acrid Taste of Persimmons. And I don't believe that's been translated. I don't recall. Uh, in one of the stories, the central char character is a woman named Mahnaz, who, like the man she marries, Faramar, um, works in a transport company. The two meet in an elevator at work on their way to their respective offices. This is the first time they meet. As Mahnaz exits the elevator, um, she t stumbles and falls, and Faramar comes to her rescue. Later, after they've been married, Faramaz remembers this incident as the decisive moment. And I quote from the novel, and these are my own translations. When you were sprawled all over the floor, you looked so funny that I thought I had to help you. Not only at that moment, but throughout life. Throughout life, end of quote. The role of the guardian, Faramaz, assumes extends to all aspects of their lives together, including all manner of household chores, um, from dusting furniture to making tea and washing the curtains. Um, she discovers that he runs his fingers over furniture to see whether he ha she has dusted properly. He acquires a pair of white gloves for this purpose alone, leaving Mahnaz completely baffled. Why do this? The story then opens with Mahnaz entering their apartment after she has visited eight apartments in search of a place of her own. She has decided to leave Faramaz, and he has no idea about her decision. With her feet smarting, she takes off her shoes and she bends down to retrieve her shoes and place them on the shoe rack, um, knowing that otherwise she would have to face Faramaz's bickering. 
She decides to leave her shoes on the floor and throws her purse on the shoe rack to boot. And she says aloud, never mind, the worst that can happen is that he will grumble and ask why she has thrown her shoes in the hallway, end of quote. She thinks to herself that for five years that they've been married, she listened to his grumbling despite her having tried to conform to all his wishes to the best of her abilities. As Mahnaz ruminates about her married life, she recalls one particular dinner party she and Faramars gave. The guest list was made up of Faramars' superiors at this transport company, and the dinner party was intended to represent him at his best. He is cozying up to his bosses. Having taken into account his various injunctions about what to serve, Mahna slaves for a week to prepare for an evening. She remembers this way, and I turn to the text now. Quote, when the guests arrived and were seated, Faramars motioned toward the kitchen, and Mahnaz served tea. Then Faramars glanced in the direction of the nut dish, and Mahnaz offered it to the guests. Then she brought out the appetizers. For a second time, she served tea to everyone with the exception of the managing director's wife who drank only hot water. Faramars glanced toward the dining table and Mahnaz cleared away the appetizers. She, didn't, uh, she did not move the nut dish because the uh, managing director's wife had exclaimed, what delicious pistachios. And Faramars had gestured to, and this is all happening with gestures, um, gesture to Mahnaz to leave it. In her trips back and forth between the kitchen and the parlor, she heard the men talking about the company. The women listened in silence, and Mahnaz was just wondering why the women weren't talking when Faramar said, Mahnaz, dear, why are you going back and forth so much? The ladies are bored. Come, sit down, talk to them. End of quote. The, place, uh, the pace of the evening and the execution of Faramars' orders encapsulate uh, Mahnaz's married, married life. The event goes almost completely according to plan until Mahnaz ventures an opinion about what is being discussed among the men. She intervenes while she's going back and forth and serving everybody. She intervenes to offer them a business solution. She tells them, for instance, that their company could rent air-conditioned containers for transportation of fruit, which tend to rot too quickly. This was the problem they were discussing. After the guests have left, Faramars uh, tells Mahnaz, quote, my dear, you were a great hostess this evening, except your beans were a little undercooked. And that's how he is. He offers opinions about everything. And I think you added too much garlic to the chicken. I'm just saying this for the sake of next time. And by the way, speaking of the next time, um, please don't speak to the company of, com of the company's business to my boss. He doesn't like women interfering in work, end of quote. With this assertion, Faramars introduces a clear demarcation between men and women's work. The division of labor masterfully performed and celebrated in Saul Shun rings hollow, however, in this story, in Pirzat's story. Not only is Mahnaz's work not confined to the realm of the apartment and their shared uh, family home, she is also subject to Faramars's assertion of authority on what could be considered women's domestic concerns. The passage I quoted above about the dinner demonstrates uh, Faramars's obsessive concerns about how food must be served, um, as do most of his exchanges with Mahnaz um, about his field, uh, what, what he perceives to be his field of power. But that's being impinged up upon, he feels, by his wife, who is also has a presence in the public sphere. The trouble with this mode of, so he's really making his own incursions into her field of authority. But the trouble with this mode of extending his power is that it does not have the desired effect on Mahnaz. She does not recognize the boundaries that are so fundamental to Faramars's self-actualization um, and acts on her instinct against his injunctions. 
She holds on to her job, opts against having children, and uses her own money to buy an apartment for herself. Um, and, we, uh, and she doesn't tell him that she's decided to leave him and move to her own apartment. What this particular domestic drama underscores is the calm detachment with which Mahnaz reflects on the life she has decided to renounce. She shows no desire to reconfigure her place in the marriage, nor does she exhibit sentimentalism about the life she is leaving behind. She lifts her cup of tea and says aloud, to my own health and my beautiful apartment. This is after she's found one that she's moving into. So the focus on the self, along with um, Mahnaz's resolve to follow her own instincts and desires, um, is a far cry from Zari's preoccupations in uh, Savoshun, the novel I discussed before. Mahnaz, unlike Zari, does not see herself as an extension of and responsible for her family. Nor does she, uh, nor, nor does her life cohere around the idea of marriage and domestic life. In the next example, I'd like to discuss um, with you is we see ties of marriage and family become even more attenuated. How, how am I doing for time? This is the last work I'm going to discuss with you. But, and it's by the author Belgais Soleimani, and it's entitled The Day of Rabbit, Ruza Khargush, which was published in 2011. So Soleimani's novel depicts women in different lines of work, including writing. And this is one of the reasons I love this work. Interestingly, Soleimani appears in her own novel as a novelist who comes under the protagonist's scrutiny and critique. She, uh, foregrounding writing as a form of work and production, she also makes an argument for writing to include the mundane and the ordinary, and I'll come back to that at the end. The narrator of the novel is the first, uh, is, is uh, the protagonist and narrator is also the protagonist, Azin Salimi, a divorced woman whose former husband has returned from the U.S. mostly for the purposes of convincing their son to go to move to the U.S. for the sake of his graduate education. Now, this ex-husband, she gets along very well with this ex-husband, but he returns as the embodiment of uh, American identity, at least in his self-presentation. Here's a little quote, totally American, brown jean pants, a well-tailored hazelnut vest. She also refers to him as the cowboy. <laughs> he lives in Texas. So. Iraj's transformation into a cowboy look-alike, his stumbling on Persian expressions he does not understand or has forgotten, and the tacit understanding between him and Azin that their son is better off going to university in the U.S. belie Iran's official antipathy toward um, the U.S. This suggests that, um, so sorry, I, I left something out. Implicitly, the narrative holds up life in America against Iran's revolutionary slogan, Death to America. Far from being at odds with her ex-husband, Az Azin actually encourages their son to move ahead and go to the U.S. So this is, this I would say, suggests a rift between national doctrine and individual belief. The image Iran projects on the world stage sometimes uh, <laughs> is of being locked in a perennial battle with, the, with an imperialist U.S. But in the fictional world of the novel, the official posture and rhetoric fade away. At least in fiction, state ideology can be short-circuited in private lives creating a double life that actually accommodates contradictory demands of social life. As if to adapt to such double lives, the protagonist of the novel, The Day of Rabbit, finds convenient disguises um, to maneuver between double or mul multiple identity. She has a twin sister called Azi Azita, with whom uh, she's easily confused because they look alike, but her sister lives in the U.S. and hardly ever uh, is mentioned in the novel. They communicate sometimes via social media. Um, 
and so there, she's hardly there. But she does exploit, that is, Azin exploits her sister's absence to, and colludes with her own brother to sell their grandfather's plot in a cemetery, an old cemetery, Emanza de Dawood, a cemetery that does not have any plots for sale anymore. So entrepreneurial individuals have found a way, in the novel I'm talking about, to make money by selling plots in which the relatives are buried. So you can just say, oh, you don't, go ahead, you can have this plot, they'll sell it. Uh, Azin impersonates Azita and colludes with her brother, who is an addict, um, and a notary who is also an addict. Um, the notary says, listen, you know, if I get in trouble, you will have to explain this. Um, so in, in this warning, the individual's responsibility vis-a-vis -vis the law is fungible and open to staging false identities. It's not clear whether economic need is at the root of Azin pretending to be her sister, but elsewhere in the novel we see her assuming different public persona that reinforce the idea. One of, now this is Azin, the protagonist, she has different lines of work. One of her means of livelihood is to pick up passengers for a fare on the streets of Tehran. Another is to translate books from English into Persian. And yet another is to give private lessons in English to young women preparing for exams, university exams, or other exams. She conceals as much as reveals her own identity to people she encounters as a driver, translator, or tutor. She adapts her public persona to the situation in which she finds herself. As a cab driver, she becomes accustomed to the range of issues her female passengers like to talk about. And needless to say, observing Iran's requisite gender segregation in public spaces, she opts for female passengers. Ready for a possible discussion of Tehran's traffic and air pollution, Azin has purchased a, an inhaler she keeps handy for the right occasion to use as a prop to assist her performance of being an asthmatic who nevertheless has to make a living exposing herself to Tehran's notorious air pollution. She has none of these symptoms. Um, if the topic of discussion then moves to the inflation and the country's economic woes, Azin, the driver, has a bundle of torn, grimy banknotes she grabs from the dashboard and waves at the passengers, exclaiming, this is all the money I've earned since this morning. <laughs> An em empathetic passenger assumes that Azin is the breadwinner of her household, which entices Azin to expand her fiction. I quote, I wish it were only household expenses. Now she's talking as a driver to one of her passengers. I have a married daughter at home and I don't have the means to buy her a trousseau and send her off to, a new, to her own home, end of quote. She promptly gets hold of a receipt, presumably for a refrigerator she claims to have bought for her daughter, and she bemoans the fact that she owes a third payment on the refrigerator that she cannot afford to make. She has mastered this role so well that even though she hands off the receipt to the backseat passengers, um, she knows they won't verify if it's genuine. It's just a piece of paper. Like the inhaler, the receipt is a prop for the roles she plays. Her play acting prompts one of the passengers to ask about her husband. And Azin launches into a, another fabrication, a story, uh, that she has developed for such occasions. She says, I quote, my husband died six years ago. We spent two and a half years going from one doctor to another, from one hospital to the next. We ended up selling even the carpet we sat on, but he was not meant to live. He died and found peace. I was left with three fatherless children. If my brother had not given me this beat up old car, we would have died of hunger, end of quote. Another you know, set of lies that she said. Azin is rewarded for her expert performance. Um, the front seat passenger, who's really moved by her story, leaves a, a, a bundle of money for her on the uh, dashboard. Throughout this segment, Azin appears to be more enthralled by the role she's playing than any pressing financial need. 
although her lifestyle is far from affluent. In her other line of work as translator, Azine appears to master a range of material, but she aims for more weighty books. Uh, while her publisher wants her to translate books that sell well, um, such as English grammar made easy, <laughs> she prefers to translate Iranian, in Iranian intellectuals' experience of modernity. <laughs> <laughs> the publisher anticipates the book will, not s will sell poorly because, as he says, now people want to live well. They, keep their, they want to keep their body and skin healthy. They're into self-help books. Uh, they want to learn from psychology, and they want to achieve calm. They're fed up by these intellectual discourses. Translators don't know a wit about these issues and consider it beneath them to translate simple how-to books." End of quote. Azin's own assessment is that the translations would sell better if the publisher was better now. Um, um, so she, she also believes that she knows better than the generation to whom she's hoping to sell these books. She, in one of her other roles, is that she, you know, as an intellectual and would be intellectual and writer and translator, she goes to these book club like gatherings. And one of these, the writer of the novel, Belghis Soleimani, shows up. The writer, Belghis Soleimani, is a character in the novel, um, shows up for a group discussion. And before the writer arrives, Azin has already formed an opinion of her based on a photograph of Belghis Soleimani printed on the cover of the book. So I quote, I take the copy of Welcome to Hades, which is the title of, a real title of one of Abel Gay Soleimani's novels, out of my bag, and for the nth time, look at the picture on the cover. A chador-clad woman in the picture is Miss Soleimani herself. From beneath her chador, she radiates a current of life that envelops the street. This clashes with the content of the book, which is about death and destruction. My first question to her will be, why this picture? Why this design? The narrator's dislike of the photograph on the cover of the book is rooted in her disdain for what she equates with the life in the provinces. And this is what she says about the writer. I quote, this Miss Soleimani looks like a fat turtle that has placed her entire village on her back, carries it from place to place. I don't know how she can write novels when she has such provincial ways, when she lacks a city dweller's mindset, when her work is filled with village relations. I don't consider her works novels. She is a writer, she's a writer of autofiction. She has written about life of Golbanu, Nahid, Robede. Eh, to be fair, she hasn't done it badly, but she's not written a novel. The novel is the product of a city and relations between city dwellers. It's supposed to pertain to, complex, to, com to the complex psyche of a city dweller and the life of the city, not narrate the uh, tale of Kolsum Nane, vi village busybodies, end of quote. When Miss Soleimani is further drawn into discussion of the symbolic association of a character with Iranian identity in contrast with another character, who is more identified with Islam and provides an answer that does not meet Azin's expectations, she declares barely out of the uh, author's earshot that literature has become truly decadent, <laughs> dismissing Ms. Soleimani's entire work. Um, I'm going to, because we really, uh, I've talked for so long, I'm going to skip to um, the next, uh, because I, I give more examples, we don't need to do that. And I wanted to now just turn to her delight, to ca the character Azin's delight in moving from one persona to another. And it, in my view, it could be interpreted as a form of liberation from a fixed role in life. But her relentlessness also suggests that she's testing the limits of subterfuge and role playing. And very rarely she flashes back to an earlier life. There's a moment in which she thinks back to when she was a student at Tehran, University of Tehran, and there's something that has a great attraction for her at that moment. 
But be beyond that particular momentary glance, um, she does not seem to have a burden of the past that she carries with herself. So when she, um, when she actually comes across events and individuals that remind her of that past, she, um, has, she actually blanks out. So I just wanted to say that, that she can't remember where she is. She once catches herself driving and she has missed a few minutes. She doesn't know where she has been. And it's the, for her, the stories we, we learn, the reason she can't revisit the past is the trauma of the revolution, the trauma of the war, what that generation experienced. Um, she humanizes, uh, now I'm, I'm turning from um, the writing about, I missed the passage here, sorry. Yeah, the generation that they found themselves engulfed in death and destruction that, um, and also as a result of the Iran-Iraq war. This untreated and unexamined trauma does not necessarily become the focus of this novel, but Belrif Soleimani writes about this in most of, in, in a great number of her works. And she was asked in an interview uh, when she would stop writing about this. And she says, I write about it so I can be freed from it. Um, so the, the, to return to Azin's character, we see that for Azin it's impossible to deal with those things and the reality of her life they requires her to, to use these subterfuges, to weave in and out of one character into another. Now to conclude then, at the end of Sawashun, um, we find Zari um, continuing her husband's battles against the forces of imperialism. While in fact the subdued and far from heroic fictional figures that I've discussed say in Zoya Pirzad, our Belre Soleimani's uh, life are far removed from the lofty ideals of um, protagonists of the uh, novel, uh, Danish Schwarz novel. There's in fact, if anything, in Mahnaz's life and in Azin's life, a, a great attention to simple and banal even details of life, everyday life. I would suggest that this turn to representing the ordinary um, and routine ways in which women's subjectivity is circumscribed is itself revolutionary at least in the context of the history of Iranian women's writing. Um, I would like to, con uh, do I have a minute to wrap up? I'd like to conclude then by citing from um, Belre Soleimani again in an interview when she's asked about her penchant for writing ordinary lives, about ordinary characters. And she provides this response. Some people believe that literature must give voice to larger human suffering or that writers must focus on the most significant events in the life of a nation or nations. For this reason, sometimes we think that attending to insignificant events is beneath literature. But the truth is that the novel is a phenomenon of a new era. And the new era's view on the human being accords the, with the novel because in the new era, the ordinary human being gains importance and uh, importance, and this very ordinary human being becomes the narrative's protagonist. It could be said, I'm still quoting Soleimani, it could be said that the era of heroes has passed. Today in fiction, the preoccupations of average characters become the subject of writers' works. In other words, it would seem that history and major events have been replaced by individual and ordinary lives. Ordinary lives that take place away from history or even mock history. This is good, she ends. <laughs> Given how much Iranian cultural and literary history has sidelined women, it's only befitting that women writers ignore or mock that history.
Thank you for listening.